moving them out. They're going to be reading from several texts today, but now I might uh, see if we have any willing volunteers to read some key texts. Let us just pray real briefly that the Lord might bless uh, our time in his word. Oh, great God, we thank you for who you are to us. You are our God, and you have chosen us to be your people. We thank you uh, for all that you are doing through your church, both here and overseas. And we ask that you would uh, bless this hour, all we have of it, and that we might uh, grow closer, grow um, in our knowledge and understanding of who you are and what you've done, as it is recorded in your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have a handout, there should be some more over here, if you do not have one. And I've also printed off a few uh, pages for resources um, for Genesis and some beginning resources for Exodus as we uh, hopefully, maybe next week or the following week, we'll begin in the book of Exodus. And at the top of your, uh, well, I would note, um, at the top of that resource page, there is a link. And if you guys want, I can email it out. Um, it's to a great lecture by uh, Reverend Dr. Mark Garcia, who is um, a pastor at uh, Emmanuel OPC, and, and well, he was. He recently took a post um, uh, in Coriopolis, PA. He recently took a post to dismantle theology um, at uh, Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. But he has a great lecture on Christology and typology that's great for seeing uh, and understanding a robust, uh, having a robust understanding of fulfillment as and as Christ is, um, as we've talked about in the last couple weeks, um, the central uh, character of both the Old and the New Testament. And so please, uh, it'd be well worth the time to listen to that uh, lecture by him. Um, at the top of your uh, handout, we have just a few key verses. Uh, there could be plenty, many more, but these are just a few that might be helpful for you to uh, commit to memory or just to have in mind um, of just important text, and some of them we will read as we go through. And today we're going to be discussing Abraham, God's covenant with Abraham, and Abraham's offspring, and the importance of Abraham and his family for the building up of the kingdom of God. Last week, if you were not here, we looked at the primordial world history from the absolute beginning in Genesis 1-1, where God creates all things out of nothing. And up through, from Genesis chapter 1, up through Genesis chapter 12, we see several generations of mankind, uh, thousands of years even. But Genesis 12 to 50, what we're going to look at in part today, only covers four generations, spanning uh, in length at least four times as long as the introductory chapter uh, of Genesis. And this shows us, as Moses, as he wrote, um, these chapters, he slows down and takes time to focus, showing us the importance of the continuing plan of God to establish his kingdom through the line of Abraham. And where we left off, and feel free as we go through, if you have any questions or think anything is unclear, um, I'd be, we'd be happy to chat and discuss these things. But before we come to chapter 12, as you see in uh, chapter 11, we see the Tower of Babel incident, um, and and then we see the line of Shem, Noah's righteous son. And there's a play on words These in, in verse 4 of chapter 11. Let's just read this real briefly. Uh, the, the peoples of the earth came together, and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the, the face of the whole earth. That name for ourselves is the Hebrew word Shem, um, which Shem uh, derives his name from. But unlike those at Babel who wanted to make a name for themselves, we see in the very next chapter, God calling Abraham to himself. Um, and God promises to Abraham that he will make his name great, not because of anything that Abraham does, but because of what the Lord does. It is he who will establish him, who will build him, and make him into a great nation. So let us read here, then, the call of Abraham in the first nine verses. As we go, we'll look at Abraham. As you have in your outline, we will look chronologically at moments of doubt in his life, but also moments of triumph, moments of faith, as we reflect on Abraham and 
demonstrate that he's really here. <clears throat> in verses uh, 12, 1 through 9. Now the Lord said to Abraham, or sorry, Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old, and he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that had, they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. And at that time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. And so he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. We see here in Genesis 1 through 3, but also uh, up to chapter 9, the first covenant promise of, uh, to Abraham from the Lord, that he will give him a land, that is a place to dwell, um, a, a, a special land, one that we read later that is flowing with milk and honey. And he also promises to make his name great, to, to make him and his family into an entire nation. And thirdly, the Lord says, he will make him blessed. That is, he will bless him in the form of the nation flocking to him. Those who honor him will be blessed, and those who curse him will be cursed. And as we read here in the following part of this chapter, do I have a volunteer who, wants, who might want to read? Uh, verses 10 through 13. Anyone? Yes. 12, 10 through 13. Yes. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. Okay, and so we read here that Abraham has a lapse of doubt. He believes what God is going to do to him, uh, that he will bless him because he moved out from that country in which he grew up. He goes to the land of Canaan, sojourning throughout the land, and yet when there's a famine in the land, he goes down to Egypt to uh, save him and his family, and then he lies to uh, Pharaoh that um, <clears throat> he tells him that Sarah is his, his sister, not, and does not reveal that he, she is his wife, and so therefore um, we see that uh, Abraham has kind of lapsed of faith. And what this does is it really puts the promises in jeopardy. How is Abraham to be, uh, to have many offspring? To, um, how is the Lord going to make of him a great nation if his wife is uh, sold to or under the possession of Pharaoh now and so it's him. And yet, this is not the end of the story here. We see that the Lord afflicts Pharaoh, we, that he afflicts his whole house, that he makes uh, his, his women barren, um, until he realizes that he has sinned against Abram by taking his wife, not just his sister. And we see here that God holds true to his word that he will curse those who attempt to curse Abram, but he will bless those who bless him. And he comes back out from the land with many possessions um, and, and being, uh, being very rich. And then we see a uh, few incidents happen with Lot and Abram meeting Melchizedek and taking over the kings of the land. But in chapter 15, we come to uh, the inauguration of God's covenant with Abraham. Um, <clears throat> still at this point, named Abram. So you're going to read here um, this great promise, verses uh, 1 in chapter 15 through, uh, I think through, just through, yeah, down to um, verse 16. Let's read here. In chapter 15. 
And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, almost uh, 90 years at this time. For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man, Eliezer of Damascus, shall not be your heir. Your very, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted to it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought them all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And the birds of prey came down on the carcass, carcasses, Abram drove them away. And as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out of great possession. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. I'll read down the next couple of verses. When the sun had gone down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire popped, and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant to Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates, the land of the Canaanites, the Kenites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And so here we see God, the, the famous portrayal of God's covenant inauguration with Abraham. He promises to, to repeat those same promises that he told them that he would uh, fulfill in, in chapter 12. That is, he will make his name great, that he will have numerous offspring, and that he will uh, give him a land to dwell in Canaan. And what we see here is a wonderful picture of covenant initiation where Abraham is given a charge, later we will see in verse 7 and chapter 17, to be blameless before him. He will be given the co uh, covenant seal and sign of circumcision. But at this time, the Lord, symbolizing that he himself will bless Abraham, that these promises will not come through fruition on, because of Abraham and what he has done, but solely by the grace of our Lord. And what does he do to signify this? A covenant ceremony, a Cut the carcasses of the animals in two, symbolizing that whoever transgresses this covenant, either God or Abram, will die. Be cut in half, just like these animals have been in the sacrifice. And Abram doesn't pass through the middle of the sacrifices, but God does alone. Initiating and telling him that I will do will be first cut in half, cut off before I fail my obligation of the covenant. And really what this is is a beautiful picture of the grace that God initiates and sustains throughout the covenant. Because and this is why we're taking the time to unravel this covenant with Abraham and uh, the narrative of the patriarchs, because this same covenant is not uh, one off, but it is the unfolding and, and continuation of that same promise that God gave to Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis 3.15. Whereas we see the covenant with Noah was God's common grace to the world, promising he will not send judgment uh, in the form of the flood. This covenant with Abraham advances the covenant of grace in a way um, that shows forth what God is going to continue to do throughout um, the ages. So after this uh, covenant ceremony initiation, we get to uh, chapter 16, and we have another moment of doubt. Even right after this great promise, this great symbol of God doing all that he will do on behalf of Abraham, in spite of Abraham's um, 
Abraham has another moment of doubt. He says that uh, Elie Eliezer of Damascus is not going to be his offspring. The covenant blessings will not come through this, this um, adopted son, but through his own loins, the son, the promise will be fulfilled. What we see in chapter 16 is um, after the covenant ceremony, Abram and Sarai try to fulfill the covenant promises on their own power, in their own power. What does he do? What happens? Well, Sarai gets in a much younger maidservant, uh, Hagar, and both of them lacking faith in God and his promises, they um, try to bring forth um, a child um, through Hagar, Ishmael, and God reminds them, not through Ishmael will you be blessed, but through your own child from the barren womb of Sarah. And then we go on to see <clears throat> what takes place after this, after in uh, chapter 17. God assures him again, even in his old age, what uh, he will do for Abraham. Would anybody like to read um, verses uh, in chapter 17, verses 9 through 14? Here we see chapter 15, we saw the covenant inauguration, and here we see the covenant sign being given. A further, just like our, uh, our sacraments are, a further sign and seal of God's grace to us in Christ. Yes, okay. Yes, sir. chapter 17, up to verse, uh, what we just read, up to verse 16, we see God's blessing upon Abraham, that he will make his name great, a multitude of nations will come before him, and he even changes his name in verse 5, that we didn't read this portion, but he says, no longer shall your name be Abram, which means um, exalted father, but Abraham, which means uh, father of nations, a multitude of nations, and so, and God was reminds him. This is an everlasting covenant. A covenant that is eternal. One that will not end. God will continue to uphold Abraham to, to sustain him even when he lacks faith and to fulfill the obligations on his behalf. But Abraham does not uh, stand by willy-nilly and let um, he, he realizes that the covenant has obligations. And so we see here in uh, the following verses in verses 18 um, and following they got circumcised to Ishmael, he circumcises all, in his old age, he circumcises himself, and realizes that even through his, his own flesh, the reproductive system which he is cutting up, he will still, um, him and his wife will bear forth a child. And so we see after this second uh, covenant meeting with God, giving him Abraham the sign and seal, which the men uh, bear in the family, we see Abraham obey. He, he does, uh, he has a moment of faith here in chapter 18, which is very important for us to just briefly touch on because of Abraham's role in the covenant as the covenant um, receiver and mediator. What does he do here in chapter 18? Well, he, God uh, meets to him, that he, he um, in the theophanic form, he meets with him and they tell him uh, just one more year, your uh, son Isaac will be born. But they also, the Lord looks over um, the judgment that is going to be occurring on Sodom. 
because of their, uh, their, their great iniquity. And what does Abraham do? Well, in verses 22 through 26 and following, we see Abraham, he intercedes as a great covenant mediator should. He intercedes not for the wicked in the city, who rightly should have judgment, but he intercedes for the righteous, even if there is a few number of righteous. Will the Lord throw out and destroy the wicked along with the righteous? And so we see here in verse 22 what Abraham says. So his men turned from there and, and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood still before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous bear as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just. And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. This is what he does. We see him pushing on the Lord, digging into that covenant kindness that he knows the Lord is and displays towards his people. And he goes down all the way to ten. Would you even spare the city if not for ten righteous people? But if we know there is not ten righteous people, there's only one righteous man. His nephew Lot and his two daughters. And so God rescues Lot, and uh, his wife unfortunately perishes on the way because she looks back to that city that the Lord had rescued him. And then we come to, after a few chapters later, another, um, probably perhaps the pinnacle of exemplary faith that Abraham displayed. After having, um, after having Isaac, his son, born, Probably, perhaps, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how, how old Abraham, or um, uh, he's, I think he's in his teen years or so, um, that is Isaac. But in chapter 22, we see God asking something uh, that we would not expect God to ask, especially of the, considering the, the promises that God had given to Abraham. We see here in verses um, 1 through 9 of chapter 22. Would anybody like to read these verses? John, okay. Chapter 22, 1 through 9. I came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place far off. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And then he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Keep reading until this time. Yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horn. So Abraham went and took the lamb and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the 
Lord will provide. As it is to this day, in the mouth of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand of which the dawn is peaceful. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to their people. And Abraham dwelt at their feet. Okay. So just before this event, in chapter 20, we saw Abraham. We didn't highlight this, but highlight it real quickly. He went down to Egypt again for famine and came back. And he told the same dubious lie to, to uh, Abimelech that he had told um, uh, the, the king there the first time that he went. And, and yet, all of Abraham's failures are eclipsed in this moment of faith here in chapter 22. We see that in verse um, 2, and again in verse um, 12, that he did not withhold his only begotten son from the Lord, but knew, as the author of Hebrews tells us, that even God could raise up his son from the dead, who offers the very one who bears in his flesh the fulfillment of the very promises that God promised to realize through Abraham. He lays it down, he's ready to strike, and God provides a ram in a thicket so that he does not have to slaughter his son. And this, of course, points forward to the great um, love that God has for us in Christ. Now, he does not withhold his righteous son, um, but and it's through Christ, obviously, that this Abrahamic promise uh, reaches its full, fullest fulfillment and to us. What we see here one thing that's important to note, I think, um, in verse 4, notice that uh, verses 1 through 3, Abraham does this, he, he obeys the Lord, they go to land, uh, Mount Moriah, and um, him and Isaac, and they cut up, they had the sacrifice ready, but it's on the third day that they saw um, the mountain and that they went up. So it is on the third day that Isaac seems to rise again from the dead, and this obviously points for Christ, who would indeed rise up from the grave and not just escape judgment, but actually undergo our path. And we'll, let's finish off the land of uh, the life of Abraham tonight, um, before or today, this morning, before uh, we close. And then next week we will finish up hopefully the rest of Genesis, looking at Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and Joseph. But before Abraham's death, which comes um, in in chapter 23. Uh, Sarah's, uh, Sarah's death. He buys a piece of land in Canaan, and this is very important. And he, uh, the people there um, know his great wealth and whatnot, and so they offer to give it to him for free. But knowing that if he was to secure it legally for his own family, if his family was to possess physical land in Canaan and not just uh, have it upon it um, by um, uh, happenstance, he needs to secure it legally. Um, for his own possession and his offspring. And so he buys a field and a cave and lands of uh, Moreh, or Mamre, and uh, he buries his wife there so that this family will grow roots in this land. And this also, we see, is an act of faith that Abraham knows that his family will one day inherit this land. And as we see him moving through chapter 3 from all these places back to um, to this land, that Abraham, um, he sojourned most of his life. He went down to Egypt a couple times. He, he traveled throughout the land of Canaan. Because, again, as the author of Hebrews tells us about Abraham, that he was searching for a city whose designer and builder was God. He was not searching to plan for himself and realize for himself the covenant of promises, but looked to God in faith. And though God uh, appointed for Abraham both offspring to bless the nations and, as well as the land to dwell in them permanently, let's remember, Abraham never himself received the fulfillment of these promises. 
so by the author of Hebrews, we also look to him as a man of faith, making him a prime example of the many examples, but a prime example uh, for Christians, um, for us in this life, that um, though not perfect, Abraham uh, exhibited a long-standing and faithful trust in God for him to be faithful to his part of the covenant. And this is the faith that we ought to imitate today. As long as we long for that heavenly country which God promises to give to us in the new heavens and new earth, um, we are sojourners among this earth, uh, having no true uh, earthly home, but heavenly home. Before Abraham dies, and we'll look at this next week, Lord willing, he tells Isaac, uh, his promised son, to take a woman from his country, from his family, just as he did, not to take a foreign wife. Um, and so he ends up taking Rebecca. And through Isaac, in chapter 25, which we'll read next week, God, through, uh, through him and Rebecca, God, um, not only do we see a lot of uh, recapitulation and um, echoes of Isaac mirroring the very same actions and deeds that Abraham did, but in addition to that, God reinstitutes and, and reaffirms those same promises that he gave to his father, that to Isaac, he will also be his God. And to Isaac, he will too, um, even if he lives in the shadow of the faith of his father, he will, through Isaac, um, bring about the fulfillment of all the promises. Through Isaac and his children, God will raise up an offspring, an offspring to defeat the serpent, um, a seed of the woman. So, that is where we are today. We'll stop there around chapter 25, and next week we'll pick up at that, um, in that chapter and look at Isaac and Jacob. Any questions? Okay, reserve the balance, but I don't know what you're doing, so sit in there. <laughs>